so now we have the public uh, uh, hearing with experts and representatives of the stakeholders on improving the accountability of the European Central Bank. Uh, so I would like to welcome all the participants to uh, this hearing, uh, the invited speakers, the members of parliament and the broader public since uh, the meeting is uh, web streamed. Uh, today's meeting will be organized uh, as follows. Um, in each of the two panels, after a short introduction uh, of the chair, there will be a speaker's round with an intervention of 10 minutes uh, each. This will be followed by three questions and answer rounds. Uh, each ECON member will have two minutes per question. Please indicate uh, who of the panelists you wish to uh, ask the, the question. After each question round, panelists will have to share uh, five to six minutes to answer. I ask you all to strictly respect the time uh, uh, given to you. Uh, and uh, uh, so please uh, be aware that phone intervention or only audio connection will not be interpreted. Um, so panel uh, one concerns the um, accountability concerning the impact of ECB policies in the Euro uh, area. So uh, first of all, let me uh, welcome our two speakers of this first uh, panel, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, former president of the European Central Bank, and uh, Rosa Lastra, professor uh, of uh, Queen uh, Mary University of London. The purpose of this first panel of the hearing is to discuss on the accountability concerning the impact of ECB policies in the euro area. It's particularly important that this debate is taking place in the European Parliament and in particular in the Committee on um, Economic and Monetary Affairs, the place where uh, nowadays virtually but uh, monetary dialogues take place. Uh, the ECB is accountable to the European Parliament for its monetary policy uh, tasks. As committee, we have always taken very seriously our responsibility in scrutinizing uh, ECB decisions in the area of monetary policy through many tools, including our monetary dialogue, questions to the ECB, studies in line with the uh, legal and institutional framework laid down in the treaties. The accountability of the ECB towards the Parliament plays a key role in light of the importance of the euro and of the single market which are the core of the European integration, but also the key element of any economic perspective for the European Union on the global stage. In light of the very distinguished panel of today, I will immediately give the floor to our uh, guests. Uh, I will start uh, the speaker's round and give the floor um, for uh, 10 minutes each, uh, starting from uh, Jean-Claude Trichet. Monsieur Trichet, on vous entend pas. Est-ce que vous voulez allumer votre micro, s'il vous plaît? On va faire un refresh de votre connexion un petit instant. J'ai le speaker. OK, vous. OK. On vous entend très bien. Uh, Madame la Présidente, Mrs. Chair, dear members of the Econ Committee, ladies and gentlemen, today I appear before your committee with particular emotion. I am with you, as a matter of fact, for the 36th time after 35 meetings during my eight terms uh, of president. As I told the European Parliament recently in January 2019, plenary in the occasion of the celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Euro, it was always, as you said, Mrs. Chair, in the European Parliament and particularly in ECON meetings, that I, would fi I could find the best support and the ECB had uh, to uh, observe the most impressive dedication to our historic European endeavor in the five years of crisis, namely from 2007 uh, up to 2011 when I was uh, president. Your decision to organize a public hearing on improving the accountability of the ECB is important, uh, 
I read with great interest the uh, studies, the very stimulative and interesting studies produced at your request. You possess with these works a very, very impressive multi-ocular and multi-dimensional vision of the issue. Uh, I would like first to say a word, you will not be surprised, on the central bank independence. As we know, the Maastricht Treaty affirms with particular stress the independence of the ECB. I quote the treaty, neither the ECB nor a national central bank nor any member of their decision-making bodies shall seek or take instructions from, I would say, any bodies, any government, any institutions. In a democracy, full independence means necessarily and simultaneously exposed accountability. The full independence of any institution in our democratic society does not stand on its own. An independent institution refusing to be accountable to society will not enjoy the trust of society and will not obviously achieve independence. And so I would say that uh, the appropriate way to preserve and enhance accountability is to apply the principle of transparency. In the case of the ECB and the ESCB, it means exploit all possible channels of dialogue and communications that exist. Among these channels, the most important by far is certainly the accountability vis-à-vis -vis the representative of the European people, yourselves, the members of the European Parliament elected by universal suffrage. It comprehends the annual report of the ECB to Parliament, the ECB feedback on the EP annual resolution on this report, the response letter to the MPs, and what is for me the most important, the hearings at the European Parliament through the Econ Committee. Let me mention uh, the other channels. Uh, they are naturally not as decisive as the relationship with the Parliament in terms of democratic accountability, but they are uh, really complementing it. I can't find of them. Firstly, the President of the Eurogroup, as well as the Commissioner, are invited to all meetings of the ECB Governing Council. Uh, secondly, the President of the ECB is invited to all meetings of the Eurogroup. Thirdly, since the crisis erupted ten years ago, the President of the ECB is invited to the European Council meetings. Fourthly, the President gives a press conference immediately after the monetary policy meetings. And finally, and it was very much at your request, uh, Mrs. Chair, the ECB publish, publishes the monetary policy accounts a, we, a few weeks after the meetings. And also to be mentioned are the relationship of the national central banks with the national institutions, governments, and parliaments. These channels of accountability are also key in the context of the federal structure of the ECB and the complexity of the emergent European public space. In normal times, in my opinion, the ECB should not have direct relationships with national parliaments. The ECB, as a European institution, is accountable only to the European Parliament, to yourself. Only in highly exceptional times, as a courtesy to the national parliament concerned, the ECB can, in my opinion, engage in such exchange of views. Last but not least, the ECB has direct communication with a large public through participation in colloquium, articles, public speeches, and recently, in the occasion of the strategic review, the ECB listens events that are organized now all over the euro area. Finally, I would say on the accountability vis-à-vis -vis the European Parliament, uh, it goes without saying that the exclusive responsibility of organi organizing your meetings is the responsibility of the chair and the members of ECON. Still, having had so many dialogues with you over time, I feel encouraged to mention three suggestions made by the experts. A little more time to the dialogue. Possibly have an ex ante agreement to give a fewer number of members of uh, MPs to ask questions that are of the essence in the view of the committee. And finally, encourage a more dynamic questioning. I will also echo the many suggestions which were made that the treaty should be modified for the European Parliament to have the right of approval of the appointment of the President and the members of the Executive Board of the ECB, as is the case in the U.S. Senate. Uh, 
for equivalent appointments. It is clearly an important and open issue, depending on the progress the European Union can make on its historical endeavor uh, to, uh, towards a political union. I would say personally, I attach enormous importance to completing political union. As part of it, I would be today in favor of giving this approval responsibility to the European Parliament, as well as I called in 2012 for giving always the last word to the Parliament in case a country, member of the EU area, disagrees with the recommendations of the European institutions. As you might know, I also called in 2011 for creating a Minister of Economy for the EU area. Now, on the uh, accountability of the ECB, depending on the overall different channels that you could exploit, I see four main issues that uh, could strive to further elucidate uh, and improve the, the accountability. The distributional effects of monetary policy, the question of the secondary objectives, the question of the present defects of the real economy of the advanced uh, countries, and also the strategy review already mentioned. These are very important issues in the present period because, first, uh, we have now important purchases of tradable securities to avoid the materialization of the deflationary risk. Secondly, because we have very low price increases which are uh, obtained on a long-standing basis and therefore the reflection on secondary objectives seems to me more timely. And third, that we have a pan we had a pandemic and pre-pandemic real economy situation which was not sustainable in the long run and probably calls for major reforms. On distributional effects of monetary policy, these effects are always pre uh, present, whatever measures are taken by the central banks, even decrease or uh, increase of interest rates have distributional consequences, as well as the purchase of tradable securities. Uh, so, to the extent that they are all commanded by the primary mandate of the ECB to deliver price stability, these measures are, in my view, necessary to protect our fellow citizens against the risk of inflation or deflation, and they are particularly necessary in the present period to pr protect the most vulnerable, the poorest, the young uh, people and the unemployed uh, in our societies against the hardship of the materialization of these risks. So even if it seems to me that uh, they are justified, that being said, of course, the ECB is working on analyzing distributional effects on its, of its policies. And your questions, your remarks in that field would be, in my opinion, very important. Second, as regards the secondary objectives, the ECB is now working on what was mentioned uh, as particularly important in the eyes of the ECB and of the president of the ECB, namely the issue of green transition and the contribution that the ECB can do in this domain, both, I would say, to facilitate the transition and to avoid the consequences of inadequate preparation of the economy as a whole. The intention of the ECB is presently to examine green changes in exploring every avenue available in order to combat climate change. It's a very complex issue with multiple dimensions. I would mention preserving the full effectiveness of monetary policy, making the difference between monetary policy instruments, collateral rules, securities purchases, and investment decisions uh, that are dealing with allocation of own funds of the ECB and of the European system of central banks. And also, I have to say, part of it, perhaps introducing other criteria that environment, uh, according to the widely now uh, communicated ESG concept, environment, social, and governance. And all this, in my opinion, is certainly a case for uh, further uh, further communication and discussion with ECON and with the Member of Parliament. 
The third dealing is the additional behavior of advanced economy, not only after the pandemic, but before the pandemic, because we had very abnormal functioning. I only mentioned low interest rates, real interest rate, very low uh, inflation, very low abnormally low growth potential and so forth. So this is part of the major difficulty uh, we have in all advanced economies. And it seems to me that the ECB is, uh, uh, as other central banks, uh, extremely appropriate, of course, to uh, discuss with the Econ Committee the uh, greed of analysis of these defects in the real economy functioning and of the structural reforms recommendations to European institutions and governments. And of course, the strategic review is the last point I will stress as very, very important. The ECB has decided to engage in a strategic review of its policy 16 years after the last review. Uh, the ECB has said the President will consult with the European Parliament. I would draw your attention on the fact that it is extremely important because, because it would uh, it is a decisive issue which will normally command the medium and long-term future of the ECB monetary policy. Mrs. Chair, dear member of the Econ Committee, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for your um, speech and uh, your suggestions. So uh, now I give the floor to Professor Rosa, Rosa Lastra from Queen Mary University of London for her 10 minutes speech. Good afternoon, Honorable Chair and members of the European Parliament. Many thanks for giving me the opportunity to present my views in this public hearing. My remarks are based on a report I wrote on this topic at the request of ECON in preparation for the September 2020 Monetary Dialogue. Both in these remarks and in my paper, I focus on the monetary function of the ECB, leaving aside its supervisory responsibilities. Next slide. Why do we need to revisit the accountability of the ECB now? First, because the growing impact of the ECB in response to the global financial crisis and to the pandemic has changed the traditional understanding of monetary policy. In the course of 2020, the ECB has adopted an unprecedented package of monetary policy measures to address the fallout of the COVID-19 crisis. Secondly, we need to revisit the accountability of the ECB now because of the legal ramifications of the decision of the German Constitutional Court of May 5, 2020, which called for the reaffirmation and enhancement of the appropriate level of scrutiny of monetary policy in the euro area, which is at the European level. Thirdly, because effective parliamentary scrutiny becomes ever more important and challenging given the distributional and other effects of monetary policy operations, as well as the growing complexity of central bank monetary responsibilities. Compared with other central banks in the world, the ECB is a relatively young central bank. It is also sui generis in that one, it was created by a treaty which is the source of its legitimacy as sovereign states voluntarily transfer monetary policy powers to the supranational arena. Two, because it is the central bank of the Eurozone, which is a jurisdictional area without legal personality. The legal personality resides in the European Union, according to Article 47 of the Treaty of the European Union, not in the Eurozone. And three, it is sui generis because it has no European fiscal counterpart in the sense that there is, at least not yet, a Euro Treasury or Euro Minister of Finance. The fiscal counterparts remain national. The jurisdictional complexity that the ECB confronts in the discharge of its monetary policy responsibilities is not faced by the Bank of England in the UK nor by the Federal Reserve System in the US. 
This explains the strong protection of independence that was granted to the ECB by Article 130 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union, which was quoted by Monsieur Truchet. A protection which is stronger than that, than that afforded to other central banks around the world with statutory independence, whereby one statute may be removed by another. But in a democratic system governed by the rule of law, independence is only one side of the coin. Since 1992, I have advocated the need for accountable independence of the ESCB in an article that I published in the Harvard International Law Journal at that time. An independent central bank is constrained by the goal or objectives and by the demands of democratic legitimacy and accountability. Next slide. The primary mandate of the ECB is price stability, according to Article 127.1 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. When the ECB was created, it was influenced by the Bundes. We have had a connection problem with Professor Lastra. We will try to. We will try to reconnect. Reconnect. Oh, here yeah, back. Is. You can speak. You can okay. speak. It's okay. The primary mandate of the ECB is price stability, according to Article 127.1 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. When the ECB was created, it was influenced by the Bundesbank model of stability and independence, in line with the Timbergen rule. One agency, one objective, one policy instrument. The Bundesbank law contained few provisions regarding the accountability of the central bank, relying instead on the support of public opinion and the statutory objective to legitimize its existence in a democratic society. This contributes to explain, in my opinion, why accountability may have only played a subsidiary role in the negotiations that led to the establishment of the ECB and ESCB. Notwithstanding the primacy of price stability, the ECB is also mandated to support the general economic policies of the Union, which include employment and growth, but also climate change and the quality of the environment, bearing in mind the broader goals of sustainability and solidarity in accordance with Article 127.1 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union and Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union. By the way, in terms of green finance, the ECB should not engage in selective credit allocation, favoring some industries and companies over others. While it is easier to hold the ECB to account in the performance of its primary objective of price stability, when it comes to the secondary objectives, because of their generic nature, it is more difficult. Accountability is facilitated when there is one goal rather than multiple goals, and when that goal is narrowly defined rather than formulated in broad terms. But given the important role that the ECB can play in reducing the economic and financial risks arising from unsustainable activity as a result of climate change, financial crisis or pandemics like COVID-19, the monetary dialogue and other mechanisms of accountability must be enhanced to respond to these challenges in the discharge of the ECB secondary objectives. Importantly, the ECB also contributes to financial stability in accordance with Article 127.5 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. Next slide. In order to assess how the accountability of the ECB in the conduct of monetary policy can be improved, we must assess the current accountability channels. The accountability of the ECB is diversified in line with the traditional articulation of accountability, trias politica. First and foremost, the ECB is accountable to the European Parliament according to Article 284 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. Secondly, the ECB is subject to judicial review by the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is the only court that can judge the legality of the acts and decisions of the ECB. Thirdly, the ECB is subject to audit control, external and internal. And finally, there are also mechanisms of accountability vis-à-vis -vis the Council and the Commission. 
cooperation with the executive, the third branch in the Trias Politica, is sui generis, given the fact that responsibility for monetary policy was centralized, while responsibility for fiscal policy remains a national competence. Finally, the ECB is also accountable to the public and must be transparent in its communication. Next slide. The adequate locus of accountability for the ECB regarding the conduct of its monetary policy responsibility is at the European level, not at the national level. And therefore, it is in front of the European Parliament and not national parliaments. Monetary policy is an exclusive competence conferred upon the ECB by the treaty. There has been a transfer of sovereign monetary powers from the national to the supranational arena. And as I stated earlier, judicial review is the exclusive responsibility of the Court of Justice of the European Union. I fully agree with former ECB president, Monsieur Trichet, that the exchange of views with national parliaments are not an obligation, not even a soft obligation, but just a matter of courtesy. Next slide, ways to improve the accountability of the ECB. First, in my opinion, the monetary dialogue should be renamed as monetary hearings to reflect the need for enhanced oversight. By renaming them as hearings, they will be treated less as a lecture or a statement by the ECB president to the members of parliament and more as an opportunity to explain and justify the actions and decisions taken. Hearings are particularly important when the central bank navigates through a crisis, such as the global financial crisis and COVID-19, because crises give rise to extraordinary measures, making the scrutiny of monetary policy by the European Parliament ever more necessary, but also ever more complex. There must be adequate deliberation, and the ECB must explain and justify as befits the nature of accountability in front of the members of the European Parliament how it evaluates the effectiveness of its monetary policy operations and how it balances its primary and secondary objectives in accordance with the treaty. I also second and support the establishment of a euro area specialized subcommittee to scrutinize monetary policy. Size is an important consideration. Back in 1997, in the context of an inquiry into the accountability of the Bank of England, I proposed that the House of Commons Treasury Committee should create a subcommittee with the specific role of monitoring the Bank of England and suggested that it be chaired by a member of the opposition, not of the ruling party. The issue of technical expertise and adequate resources, though essential to hold an independent central bank to account, can be a double-edged sword as politicians as well as judges need not be trained in monetary affairs. And populist movements have criticized technocracies in recent times. It's been observed that the change of public perception towards central bank independence might put it at risk. Therefore, the discussion about legitimacy, accountability, and transparency is ever more relevant. I also second that the European Parliament should have a formal enhanced role and not simply consultative in the appointment procedure of the ECB president and other members of the ECB executive board. Next and last slide. In terms of transparency, the ECB has endeavoured over the years, as Monsieur Trichet explained, to expand the information it discloses, notwithstanding the critique that it does not publish the minutes. The monetary policy accounts introduced in 2015 do not report how individual members of the governing council vote to put names to comments made by individuals. But we should remember that Article 10.4 of the ECB statute, which is primary law, prescribes that only the outcome can be published, but not the minutes. Furthermore, the voting records are not published in order to protect the personal independence of the members of the governing council who could otherwise be subject to undue political pressure from the countries where they come from. For these reasons, as well as the civil law tradition of not publishing dissenting opinions to reinforce collegiality, the ECB does not currently publish the minutes, nor the voting records, nor the dissenting opinions. Finally, I also second effective audit control to provide a basis and input for subsequent parliamentary oversight and improve transparency in line with recent developments in the Bank of England that I discussed in my report. Very many thanks, Honourable Chair, members of the European Parliament, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we can start our uh, round of uh, Q&A. Um, so to the, with the ECON uh, members, uh, please limit your intervention to two minutes. Indicate to whom the question is directed and do not forget to press the speak button before taking the floor. So now we start with the first uh, round. We are taking questions from two uh, maps, uh, and then we will uh, give the floor to uh, the speakers for five minutes for reply. We start with the uh, EPP member, Jose Manuel Garcia Margallo. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Monsieur Trichet, we are the... Monsieur Trichet, I'm very pleased to uh, see you here. Je recommence alors, uh... So let me begin again. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, good afternoon, Mr. Trichet. I'm very happy to see you again. And I'd like to ask you and Ms. Lastra some questions. Firstly, two details. The central bank is independent, like the Bundesbank, but it's much more independent than the Bundesbank. Firstly, because the statutes of the Bundesbank can be changed rather easily. Changing the European Central Bank statutes is virtually impossible. Secondly, because the Bundesbank has a counterweight in a federal government, which is not the case with the European Central Bank. So my questions are related to the objectives of the bank, the primary objective, the price stability, and then the second objective, the um, uh, aims of the general economy, which are auxiliary but mixed with the primary objective. And then uh, the outlook for the medium and long term and the short term outlook and consequences of the ECB's policy, low interest rates and so on. As we all know, the crisis has required the suspension of the rules on uh, deficits and debt. So we're going to have an unknown, uh, previously unknown level of debt. And so my first question is if at some point inflation begins to rise again, obviously not immediately, should the ECB raise interest rates at the risk of creating a debt crisis in some member states or forget this side of things and follow a traditional policy? Secondly, uh, this is perhaps less easy to answer. It's probable that at some point the debt issued by member states will be so great that markets begin to prioritise and select. So there may be a, uh, a crisis of differences in uh, risk premiums. Do you think this is likely? Much now. I give the floor to Aurore Lalouk for S and D for her question. Bonjour, uh, bonjour. Good afternoon, everyone. Chairman, colleagues, thank you very much for uh, the uh, speeches we heard. When the ECB was created, there was no cons political consensus on the issue of uh, climate change. And it's only understandable that the ECB hasn't uh, got these kinds of risks included among it, its mandate. But with uh, growing scientific knowledge, the EU has tried to reduce its carbon footprint. We now know that climate change is a major systemic risk, particularly with the danger of stranded assets and uh, uh, colleagues uh, in the US, in the US Fed, have uh, noted the systemic risks of uh, climate change. However, the mandate of the European Central Bank uh, 
uh, has to be the same missions as the European Union as a whole, or at least be in line with them. So the question is, how is the ECB going to be able to adapt its action to this new reality? First of all, don't you think it's high time we broke with the so-called market neutrality approach and moved to a much more active, proactive approach to uh, risk management. Looking at uh, leverage and pollution by sector. Can we move towards a real greening of the asset purchase programs and the banks that they supervise? If the ECB doesn't change its mode of action, isn't the ECB going to end up going against the, uh, the parts of its mandate that uh, are supposed to be for stability and to promote the EU's policy objectives? Because I think if it failed to do that, then it wouldn't be undermining the purpose it was created for. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, I'm not sure who I should give the floor first because the questions were not directed specifically to one or the other speakers, maybe both. Uh, so we uh, let's start from uh, uh, Jean-Claude Twichy uh, to answer to these questions and then I give the floor to Professor Lastra. Merci beaucoup. Je Thank you. I imagine I'm being heard. Just a few words. I think we each have five minutes to answer or less than five minutes. Pour les deux. Pour les deux. Five minutes for both. For both. Thank you very much. Firstly, I would say that the accountability of the European Central Bank is actually strongly underlined in the treaties. And it's true that the fact that the independence of the ECB is guaranteed by the treaty strengthens its independence vis-a-vis -vis or in comparison to any other central bank in the world. That's uh, true and uh, strengthens the need for the ECB to be as uh, accountable and responsible as possible. On the two questions that were act, uh, asked by the first uh, MEP, who I'm very pleased to uh, see again, I would say that obviously the primary mandate of the ECB is to ensure price stability against deflation and inflation. And there's a, a clear symmetry there. If there's a threat of inflation, obviously the ECB has to take appropriate measures and uh, its monetary policy has to be much less flexible than it can be if the main risk is the risk of deflation. So for me, it's clear that the ECB's monetary policy depends on the exact situation it's in, in terms of price stability. And the second part of that question was on debt. The main problem that we have in Europe, of course, is that we have different countries that are in different situations and the market can take advantage of those differences and different levels of debt, different levels of credibility of the uh, signature of the country in question, and that can create uh, serious problems. Greece, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, even Italy. I had problems there. They were in very difficult situations vis-a-vis -vis, um, investors and savers around the world. A lot depends on the countries themselves. They need to be as responsible as possible. A lot depends on the central bank itself and the institutions that were created since the last crisis. I won't uh, mention them all, but I would imagine that we won't have the same kinds of uh, problems of that kind again as we have. Had, we've had today. 
to Ms. Laluc, I would say that the European Central Bank is very actively reflecting at the moment on whether to or how to bring in the environment to its uh, approach. And I think it's a very important issue. It has many aspects, but I would encourage people, I would encourage the ECB and, as you suggest, Ms. Laluc, to continue along that path and to ensure there is consistency between correcting climate change, solving climate change, which is key under current circumstances, and should be mainstreamed into all its measures. There isn't only, of course, uh, monetary policy or investment, own resources and uh, prudential rules, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, intended five minutes for both of the guest speakers to answer to uh, both of the, the maps, but I realize it is really a short time uh, for such complicated question. Now I give the floor to Professor Lastra. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Let me just answer briefly, given that we have little time, first to Senor Margallo and the, the ECB is indeed more independent than the Bundesbank because the treaty is more difficult to amend than the statute. The statute can always be removed by another statute. And also the ECB does not have, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, a European fiscal counterpart. One of the issues going forward for the ECB is whether a treaty change is necessary. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and this addresses to some extent the question posed by Madame Laluc, the uh, objective of financial stability, for instance, in the legislation in the United Kingdom, uh, as an objective of the Bank of England, was put on equal footing with the objective of price stability. And the Dodd-Frank Act in the U.S. also reinforced the goal of financial stability. To change the treaty, as we know, is more difficult, but it might be necessary going forward to, if we want to have price stability and financial stability on equal footing to amend the treaty. Uh, at the moment, as Monsieur Trichet indicated, the primary objective is price stability, which includes both fighting inflation and deflation. So if it is the case that inflation is going to rise in a post-COVID scenario, there was a recent book by Charles Goodhart and Manoj Prada that they argue that it might be the case that uh, inflation will rise, then the primary objective according to the treaty is price stability, and that is what the ECB will need to do. When it comes to reinforcing the accountability mechanisms of the ECB and looking into the medium to long term, some of the proposals that I suggested do not require a treaty amendment. Others, however, might require a treaty amendment, and again, that's why it is fundamental as we move through further programs of quantitative easing and non-conventional instruments of monetary policy that the European Parliament exercises adequate oversight, adequate scrutiny and adequate accountability. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move to the next uh, uh, two uh, uh, maps for questions. Billy Kelleher from Renew. is, you know, the, the fine line between accountability and, and uh, independence. And certainly, I suppose, over the last number of years, that would have been always, you know, a, a political debate because of the fact that the ECB was very involved in the internal uh, fiscal matters of some countries because of the bank bailout that uh, Mr. Trichet referred to in terms of Ireland, Portugal, Spain and elsewhere. But we've now moved on from that. But we now have a significant challenge in terms of uh, you know, huge sovereign debt because of the global pandemic and the impact that that's having on economies. And I suppose the next question is, you know, how do we guarantee that 
why the European Central Bank acts independently, but yet is held accountable. And at the same time, we have member states that will have to make very serious decisions in terms of their financial frameworks and borrowings and debt sustainability over the next number of years. And they're doing all that based on the fact that we are in negative interest rates, uh, sovereigns can access markets uh, quite comfortably, and the ECB is continually uh, purchasing bonds and is in the market actively uh, underpinning uh, so sovereign debt. So the, the concern obviously would be that you know, if this policy changes, it could have profound impacts on the sovereigns of countries that are indebted. And if you do look at the debt profile of many countries in the European Union, there is uh, significant challenges there. So the question I ask is, you know, at what stage does the ECB make decisions based on um, the integrity of the Eurozone as a whole? Or do they sometimes have to look at uh, larger countries within the Eurozone that may have debt sustainability challenges? Um, and do they always just make it in the interest of the Eurozone? And finally, can I just ask, governments, national governments appoint this, their own central bank uh, people and then they are nominated to the European Central Bank. Is there any concerns with the ECB that in years ahead we could end up with people appointed by national governments that are actually elected because they are hostile to the Eurozone and the Euro currency and therefore could be hostile to the ECB and what it is trying to achieve? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to Francesca Donato from ID. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Um, well, uh, I, of course, I agree that accountability is a crucial issue, especially in this historical moment. And uh, I, of course, agree uh, with the need of more transparency in, in the EBC uh, role and mandate. Uh, and uh, I... I add to this even regarding the bank's uh, super banking supervision role of EBC. And uh, that must be achieved uh, through the enhancing of the role of the EP uh, through the Econ Committee. But uh, I think that to improve uh, EBC accountability uh, needs only uh, a closer connection between its mandate and the EU citizens' interests. And in this moment, uh, uh, ensuring the ECB's independence when a huge amount of EU national sovereign bonds uh, purchased puts uh, its future monetary policy in a path of necessary consistency with it, means to give to the EBC the, uh, a wider mandate, a wider scope, uh, and that should be the one of uh, uh, pursuing the full employment. And, and it would also be necessary to remove the constraints in the treaties to, to ECB monetary policy, uh, that's to say the debt monetization ban. And so I ask to the speakers, if in your opinion, are these steps a possible way to, to give concrete substance to the EU ideals of solidarity and to improve EU citizens' trust in ECB and in other EU institutions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give back the floor to our guests uh, for uh, answers. Uh, Mr. Trouchet. Merci beaucoup. Thank you indeed for, uh, for these questions. Uh, I would say both questions were uh, quite related. Uh, uh, very rapidly, I would say that uh, the um, main responsibility of the ECB, it seems to me, in any circumstance, is to ensure price stability at the level of the euro area as a whole and ensure that the monetary policy decisions which are taken at the level of the governing council of the ECB are transmitted to all countries as well as possible and to understand what has been done by the ECB since <clears throat> the crisis of uh, Lehman Brothers up to now, you can see that uh, the ECB has been extremely uh, attentive to convey monetary policy decision appropriately, as appropriately as possible to all countries, including when there were spreads that were accumulating between the signature of uh, various countries. 
it was not up to the ECB, it seems to me, and it's, I have to say, it is, it was the, uh, I would say, long-standing position of the ECB to judge whether one particular country can be left without having the correct monetary policy transmission. That's the reason why a lot of decisions were taken. The, in my time, the SMP, uh, which was directed towards a number of countries where monetary policy was impaired, transmission was impaired, because there were a, a lot of spreads in a, a number of countries. After uh, my, my own term with Mario de Draghi, there were other measures that were taken uh, in order to ensure this uh, correct transmission of monetary policy. And I have to say, in a way, the pandemic uh, program of the ECB recently is also sufficiently flexible to pave the way for the appropriate transmission of monetary policy to all the euro area. So again, the, this of course is the responsibility of the ECB, but it calls also for highly responsible attitude from all other partners, certainly the national governments, the national parliaments, uh, which have a major responsibility in their own credit worthiness, and of course the commission under the uh, scrutiny, if I may, of the European Parliament. As regards the uh, so-called monetization, uh, uh, monetization of, of the uh, uh, public debt, uh, which is something which is observed in Japan, uh, is observed, not, not observed, I would say, but you have a large number of treasuries uh, in the balance sheet of the Japanese Central Bank, of the U.S. Central Bank, even more than in the ECB balance sheet. But uh, the uh, main issue is that this so-called accumulation or piling up of uh, outstanding treasuries is not done on purpose to help governments. It is done for monetary policy reasons. And when the monetary policy reasons will not be there anymore. And I hope, of course, that uh, we will see that because appropriate uh, decision will be taken and structural reforms will be taken by all the, the other partners other than central banks. When it comes, then progressively, it is my working assumption, we will see the diminishing of these outstanding treasuries in the balance sheet of central banks in Japan as well as in the US, as well as in Europe. And uh, I hope very much that we will have a smooth transition to something which would be more normal, because it's not normal to have this piling up of outstanding treasuries in the present period. And again, it's not a European problem, it's a global problem. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Lastra. Thank you very much for these very interesting questions. When it comes to fighting crises such as the pandemic or the global financial crisis, clearly the ECB needs to act with the other authorities at the European level and not sometimes too much is expected of the ECB. So I think it's important to first take that into account. The ECB has done everything that it can to fight economic and financial risks that have arisen from both the global financial crisis and its effect on the Eurozone and the pandemic. But it's not only the responsibility of the ECB. The point of the independence, I think, is, is fundamental. The national governors, as well as the members of the governing council, should be independent, and that is one of the basic tenets that sustain the credibility of the European Central Bank. So that, I think, is uh, something that needs to be preserved going forward. There is always a balance between independence and accountability. It's like freedom and responsibility. And in this balancing act, when the European Central Bank is exercising greater or extraordinary powers, there also needs to be corresponding mechanisms of enhanced accountability. The distributional effects of monetary policy, such as QE, or an important element which again requires adequate parliamentary oversight. And I'm glad that you mentioned solidarity is indeed one of the broader objectives, solidarity and sustainability, to which Article 3 of the Treaty of the European Union refers to. 
and therefore is part of the secondary objective of the ECB. In the medium to longer term, the ECB needs to take into account the economic and financial risk which arise from both unsustainable activity as well as the social dimension of solidarity. So I'm glad that you mentioned that in your question because I think that in the balancing between the primary and the secondary objective, when the European Parliament subjects the ECB to account, they need to take into consideration the broader objectives which are reflected in Article 3 of the Treaty for the European Union. And at the same time, consider the impact of those broader objectives such as climate change on what is actually the mandate of the ECB with regard to price stability as well as the contribution to financial stability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we move on to the next uh, uh, two uh, maps. Uh, we start with the Sven Giegold from the Greens. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Professor Lastra and uh, Jean-Claude. Uh, it's great to see you again, and uh, it's a pity that we can't meet uh, in person. Uh, and uh, it has been indeed a far too long time. Uh, look, uh, the, the trigger for this hearing clearly was the judgment of the Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe of Germany, uh, which uh, marked, of course, a clear signal uh, towards um, limits of the ECB in their view under the German Constitution. And uh, also Professor Lastra uh, made a remark in this regard. Therefore, I'm asking the two of you, do you think that the judgment, which is on the one hand um, targeted to the PSPP program, but also has indirect consequences and dangers towards the ongoing PEP project and PEP program, is an overstepping of uh, the constitutional European order? Uh, do you think it is needed to take action uh, in this case against Germany in order to ensure that um, the accountability towards this parliament is respected, but most importantly that it, that it is ensured that it is the European uh, Court of Justice who is responsible for controlling the legality of actions of the ECB and no one else. Uh, and I would really like your frank and open assessment whether uh, it would be uh, justified and necessary or necessary for the European Commission uh, to take action in, sen in the sense of infringements. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor. We have three uh, speakers now together uh, to uh, Johan van Oberfeld from ECR. Ah, no, we're, we're... Monsieur Van Overfeld, can you press the speak button, please? OK. You hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, also certainly President Trichet and Professor Lastra for your introduction and for the answers you gave to the questions that have been raised so far. Uh, I have two questions for uh, Professor, uh, for uh, President uh, Trichet. The first uh, re is uh, regarding the following. Uh, should national parliaments be involved in the monetary dialogue um, and Related to this question, the question whether we should uh, national central bank governors also get involved in the monetary dialogue hearings, for example, when certain uh, issues pertaining to particular member states are at hand. That's my first question. My second question is somewhat broader, but since we are also discussing the impact of ECB policies on the euro area, uh, th th this question or this argument is the following. We've seen now extraordinary uh, monetary policies for years now, uh, uh, and it's mostly because the ECB uh, tries to get to its 2% or close to 2% inflation target. 
it is clearly very, very difficult for the ECB to uh, get to that uh, objective. Uh, if not, almost impossible at this point in time, probably because there are determinants of inflation that are entirely outside of the realm of the European Central Bank. So my uh, question or my remark is quite simple. Hasn't it become time for the ECB to seriously uh, reflect on the sustainability of its 2% inflation target as the ultimate uh, policy objective? Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, we only had two uh, uh, members to ask uh, questions, so now I give back the floor to uh, President uh, Trichet and then to Professor Lastra for the replies. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for uh, this uh, question. Uh, on to Sven Gigold, I would say uh, I really consider that it is clear that the Karlsruhe judgment is not, frankly speaking, compatible with the organization, the legal organization of Europe. Fancy what would happen if all constitutional court in all member countries of the, EC, of the Euro area would uh, ask for such clarification, modification, changes, and so forth. So this is something which is obviously profoundly abnormal. The ECB is a European institution accountable to European authorities, and it's clear for me that the European Court of Justice is the only institution which uh, has a say on uh, these matters, clearly. Uh, that being said, I consider that the way the German government, the uh, German parliament, uh, uh, in connection with the uh, Bundesbank, uh, I would say, dealt with, the, with this issue, which was really very, very grave, uh, was as correct as possible in the circumstances. But again, bottom line, this is not possible because we cannot have all constitutional court embarking on um, criticizing uh, ex post the decision of the ECB. I hope I was as clear as possible. As regards uh, Mr. Van Overtveld, uh, I would say uh, that the national uh, parliaments uh, have their own way of uh, understanding what's going on because we are in a federal system and the national central banks normally in most of the countries, to my knowledge, if not in all countries, are in connection with their own parliaments. And you know that it is certainly the case in the Bundesbank, in the in Banque de France, in Banca d'Italia, in all uh, central banks, national central banks, there is a connection with the European Parliament. And the National Central Bank can explain uh, how it sees the, uh, I would say, decision of the governing council. I don't trust that it would be appropriate to mix up the uh, national parliaments with the European parliaments and uh, the uh, uh, ECB with the uh, national central banks. Uh, as I already said in my introductory remarks, it would be better, in my opinion, to have a, a division of labor, uh, which, uh, again, could, could be uh, perhaps uh, appropriately uh, uh, transgress if uh, by courtesy, it appears that uh, a courtes dialogue at a moment or, or another is uh, appropriate. But normally, no, I would say uh, strict uh, separation because there is a national level, there is the European level. And it seems to me in this respect, I, I take it that, of course, the European Parliament has something which is unique in Europe. Uh, as regards the uh, uh, 2%, uh, definition of price stability. All need to mention that the um, Central Bank of the United States reflected on its strategic review, and after long and due uh, discussion and meditation, they decided to maintain the 2%. The Bank of Japan has the 
at, to my knowledge, under the control of uh, Professor Lastra, the Bank of England has also a reference to 2%. So it seems to me that there is something uh, uh, stronger than is generally perceived behind the 2%, which, by the way, we're more or less, we were more or less in the ECB the first to uh, communicate uh, 2% as a figure, as uh, something important. But now there is a consensus of all major central banks of the uh, advanced economy to consider that it's an appropriate reference. So that being said, uh, the ECB is reflecting presently, to my knowledge, on how to define exactly, not the 2%, I hope that they will maintain the 2% and not detach themselves from uh, Japan, from the US, from the UK, but uh, that they, they will uh, see exactly how do you envisage core inflation or uh, uh, HICP, uh, the headline inflation, whether you uh, reason medium long term more than was done in the past and so forth. So there are a lot of uh, uh, important issues that have to be examined, discussed, of course, as has been promised by the ECB with the ECON, and uh, it seems to me that it is a matter for further further discussion uh, what, that are very important, and for the as far as the importance of this issue, I uh, fully share the view of uh, Mr. Overtfeld. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, very, very much. Uh, so we uh, have uh, finished our round. Oh, Professor Lastra, I'm sorry. I apologize. I was looking at the watch. Sorry, Professor Lastra. Thank you very much for giving me the floor again. And first I will speak to the question that was put by Sven Gigol. And the ECB is clearly subject only to the judicial review by the Court of Justice of the European Union. The Court of Justice of the European Union is the only one that can judge the legality of the acts and decisions of the ECB, and this is established by the treaty itself. Article 263 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union and Article 35 of the Statute of the ESCB clearly say that the only court that is competent to judge the actions and decisions of the ECB is the Court of Justice of the European Union. So the decision of the German Constitutional Court, I have great respect for that court and their judges, is something which is not certainly binding regarding the PSPP upon either the ECB or really the national central banks, which in the competences that have been transferred from the national to the supranational arena and monetary policy is clearly one matter of exclusive competence, EU law has primacy over national law and the rulings of the European Court of Justice are binding on all national courts. To me, that's a very important part of this European locus of accountability. Also, as I said before, it is the European Parliament the adequate locus when it comes to parliamentary control. Uh, I will not enter into the question on infringement proceedings that has been mentioned. I will just reiterate that it is important to understand the adequate locus of accountability and judicial review, which is clearly European. With regard to the target of 2%, just briefly, what the treaty refers to is price stability that was interpreted as 2% increase per annum that could be changed in future. In the years that preceded the crisis, many people argue that inadequate attention to the risks of financial stability contributed to the global financial crisis and that these days central banks and the ECB should be no exception should pay increasing attention to risks that arise from financial stability and therefore that you know going forward in the review that the ECB does of its own mandate it is a, this balancing act between the primary and the secondary objective and this balancing act between price stability and financial stability must be taken into account and also must be subject to the oversight of the European Parliament. Thank you, Ms. Chair.
Thank you, uh, thank you very much. I really thank the, uh, the two speakers, President Touche, Professor Lastra, for their availability and generosity in responding to all uh, uh, our, uh, our questions and for the interesting presentation. So I am uh, confident that uh, the ECON members will take your contribution into account in the context of the crisis response and also any future legislative proposals, so thank you again for your uh, precious uh, contribution. And uh, uh, we can now move on to the uh, second uh, panel uh, of our uh, public hearing uh, that uh, concerns the experience with the central bank accountability in member states and third countries, including the impact of parliaments on their respective national central banks. And in this context, we are very pleased to be able to welcome for this uh, uh, panel uh, Helen uh, Schubert, uh, Head of Foreign Research Division, Austrian National Bank, and uh, Vivienne Schmidt, uh, Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration at Boston uh, University. As I was saying, the, um, the objective uh, of this panel is to discuss the experience with central bank accountability in member states and third uh, countries, and uh, this panel will provide us with a broader perspectives on other experiences in order to see how the role and concept of central bank accountability has been interpreted and declined in different uh, jurisdictions and circumstances. Of course, such a debate is uh, mutually very interesting in order to understand the framework in which such a delicate and key uh, mandated, uh, in, uh, enshrined and operationalized. Uh, now, we, uh, I will immediately start uh, the speaker's round and uh, give the floor to the invited uh, speakers for 10 minutes each. Uh, started uh, starting with uh, Helen uh, Schubert from the Austrian from National, the Bank. National Bank. Um, thank you, Mrs. Honourable Chair. Thank you um, the mem to the members. Uh, good afternoon to the members of the European Parliament. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to the honourable members of the Econ Committee. In my introductory remarks, I will give an overview of accountability arrangements of major central banks and will then make a few remarks on the accountability of national central banks in the euro area. My focus will be on the monetary policy aspects of accountability, although I'm well aware that there are other important functions, including prudential supervisions as well, that are subject to accountability arrangements. But first of all, I should start with the usual disclaimer the views I'm going to express are exclusively my own. They do not necessarily represent those of the Österreichische Nationalbank or the Euro system. Central bank independence and accountability are two sides of the same coin. A high degree of independence is an important prerequisite for central banks being capable of fulfilling their mandate. It protects the central bank from being diverted from its mandate, possibly as a result of short-sighted motivations. Accountability, on the other hand, ensures that the mandate is fulfilled, in particular central banks with far-reaching political goal and operational independence must be held accountable to a high degree. Economists typically refer to procedures of exposed accountability, such as appearances of central bank officials in front of parliamentary committees or reporting requirements. But on top of exposed control, Accountability can already be exercised before monetary policy decisions have been taken. Examples of, uh, are, for instance, procedures of deliberations with central banks about the precise interpretation of the mandate. Another aspect of ex-ante accountability relates to the appointment procedures of central bank officials. When comparing the Fed, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan and the ECB, the ECB stands out with its high degree of independence, which is enshrined in the treaty. The other central banks, which I mentioned, are operationally independent, but their, but their mandate and operational procedures can be changed with new legislation. And that accountability is considered uh, being most advanced in, in, uh, or in, in the Bank of England. According uh, to the Bank of International Settlements, the vast majority of central banks is accountable to Parliament, as are all of the central banks uh, considered here. The Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, are also accounted to the government. 
Appointment procedures, as mentioned in the beginning, are an element of ex-ante accountability, while the European Parliament takes an advisory role in the appointment of the ECB executive board members before an appointment is made. In the United States and in Japan, however, approval of the accept respective parliaments has to be obtained before the appointment of the members of the board become effective. Procedures of, ex, of um, uh, the uh, central bank uh, performance control, so the compliance uh, with the mandate, are at the heart of central bank ex post accountability. And the more specifically defined the goals are, the more effectively can ex post accountability be assessed. But for the Bank of England, uh, the Bank of Japan and the ECB, price stability is the only or main monetary policy objective. The Fed uh, also pursues the objective to promote maximum employment, which is in no way subordinate to the price stability mandate. And the Bank of England stands out in that the Treasury has the authority over the definition of the price stability in quantitative terms. In the case of the ECB, the Fed and the Bank of Japan, the definition of the details of the price stability objective is the authority of the respective central banks. Accountability vis-a-vis -vis the parliaments is typically exercised via written reports and parliamentary hearings, similar to the monetary dialogue held between the European Parliament and the ECB. A dialogue also takes place between the Bank of England's members of the Monetary Policy Committee and the House of Commons Treasury Select Committee, which has statutory authority to scrutinize the Bank of England. The Fed Chair appears twice a year before the US Congress, once in front of the Committee on Bank and Financial Services of the House of Representatives, and once in front of the Committee on Housing, uh, Banking and Urban Affairs uh, of the Senate. In the case of Japan, uh, the, the governor and other members of the policy board appear twice a year in front of each of the chambers of the diet in monetary policy matters. At the back of unconventional monetary policy measures, uh, central banks worldwide have stepped up their efforts in strengthening accountability. And over the years, uh, they converged in their uh, communication with respect to monetary policy decisions uh, over the years. In the, meantime, in the meanwhile, all of the central banks hold a press conference immediately after they have taken monetary policy decisions. And just to mention, the ECB was a pioneer in establishing from day one monthly press conferences immediately following the Governing Council uh, meetings. The Federal Reserve only adopted this practice in uh, uh, 2010, 11. Moreover, the Fed, uh, the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England published minutes, including voting records. And in 2015, the ECB started to publish the accounts of monetary policy meetings that include a summary of the discussions in an unattributed form. Now let me make a few remarks on uh, accountability of national central banks in economic monetary union. Um, the extent to which national central banks are scrutinized by national parliaments in the euro area hasn't received much attention so far. Even after the transfer of monetary sovereignty to the supranational level, euro, national, euro area national central banks have continued to manage a wide range of responsibilities. But there are a range of legal accountability requirements. With the exception of a few central banks, all euro area national banks are required to report to their parliaments. Some of them may be heard by parliament at the request of committees, while for others, almost half of them, hearings are compulsory. And even if formally not obliged to do so, some central bank's officials attend hearings fairly regularly and uh, submit written evidence. But let me make a few remarks on the more broader question. As already mentioned, uh, in the first session, with regard to monetary policy, the locus of ECB's accountability is at the European and not at the national level. Uh, governors of national central banks do not represent their respective countries, but the interests of the euro area when they attend governing council meetings. National central banks, this is my second remark, could probably play a more crucial role in shoring up trust in the euro system and ensuring that ECB decisions are accepted by audience beyond uh, financial markets. Ideally, in the future, national central banks may not only translate ECB governing council decisions for different national audiences, and thereby complementing the ECB communication, 
This particular communication channel might also work in the opposite direction. National central banks could and probably should more often listen to stakeholders and citizens at large. Um, third comment, this form of accountability, which contains both exposed and ex-ante elements of accountability, is not only important from the perspective of democratic legitimacy. There is uh, compelling empirical evidence suggesting that increased clarity about central banks' mandates, their reaction functions and inflation aims has contributed to anchor inflation expectations and to reduce the variability around the communication, communicated inflation aim. Only if the public and investors understand the goals of monetary policy are inflation expectations more likely to remain well anchored. And without doubt, financial markets and banks, by implementing changes in financial conditions, play a decisive role in transmitting bank policies and signals to the real economy. But households and firms are uh, important as well, in particular in view of cross-country differences in wage and price setting. A credible nominal anchor may act as an coordinating Twice device. Fourth comment, despite unprecedented circumstances, the ECB was successful in delivering financial monetary conditions that are exceptionally supportive of the real economy. So why has rema inflation remained uh, low? One of the reasons for this phenomenon could be the secular decline in wage bargaining power that contributed to a significant part of recent productivity gains no longer being distributed to labor. This had adverse consequences for real disposable income, consumption growth, and ultimately inflation. And strengthening the dialogue with social partners, those that are directly involved in the wage setting process, as suggested by some stakeholders, a kind of macroeconomic dialogue at the national level might be an idea worth discussing. And here I would like to mention that before Austria joined European Monetary Union, incomes and monetary policies were loosely interacting to support the credibility of the exchange rate target vis-a-vis -vis the Deutschmark and avoid bad So Schubert, do you want to uh, push the speak button again, please? Yes, uh, hello, could you hear me? I'm sorry. It's okay, go on. It's okay, go on. Okay. It's okay. Um, yes, I, I, I just wanted to, to, to say that uh, um, I thank you very much for your attention. I hope you heard, uh, heard everything. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you uh, very much. Now I give the floor to the uh, second uh, speaker, Vivian uh, Schmidt, uh, Jamonet Professor of European Integration at Boston University. Professor Schmidt, you have the floor for 10 minutes. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to speak to the Econ Committee on this very important topic. So my focus is on the ECB accountability in comparative perspective. As the most independent of central banks, the ECB by mandate has actually comparatively less accountability than most other central or all other central banks. Um, now, to define accountability, I see it as officials giving account and being held to account in relevant public forums. By this definition, the ECB certainly has increased its accountability over the past decade after what I see as some serious lapses in the early phase of the Eurozone crisis. Uh, the question today is how to ensure greater accountability for the ECB in the future, in particular in light of major changes related to, COVID to the COVID-19 pandemic. For this, I provide a comparative perspective, not only the, on the question of accountability to whom, i.e. in which forms of accountability, but also accountability for what, meaning the objectives of the ECB and their impact. I end with recommendations for democratizing the ECB accountability via what I'm calling a great macroeconomic dialogue to, engage, to have, ensure public deliberation on grand strategies for future growth. So to begin, central banks accountability to whom? This can best be understood as central banks giving account and being held to account for their actions in two kinds of forums. The first is political, 
the one that we've been talking about all this time, uh, made up of legislative bodies engaged in parliamentary oversight. But the second is technical, expert forums, central banking forums to ensure best practices for optimal performance. So first, accountability in political forums. Um, national central banks accountability in political forums can be characterized as operating in the shadow of politics. Although these are all independent bodies, uh, they're appointed by the legislature in, a legislature in combination with the executive. They also have an obligation, as we've already heard um, before, to report regularly to parliamentary monitoring committees to explain their actions, but also importantly, to be subject to formal sanctions if need be. Over time, such discursive accountability, which are the words of Paul Tucker, former deputy governor of the Bank of England, such discursive accountability has become more robust, more robust in legislative forms as well as to the public. So for the ECB, accountability to public forums is weaker. Uh, it's not just more independent than all other cent national central banks. It also operates much less in the shadow of politics. It's farther removed from politics for a range of reasons that you all know. Um, by mandate, it has less formal political accountability. The, EPE, the European Parliament does not have a role, a major role, in appointments. Um, the ECB president has to explain, certainly, and respond to questions in quarterly meetings, but the ECB president need not heed the European Parliament's advice, nor can the European Parliament sanction the ECB. And as we've already heard, there are issues in terms of ECB transparency. Nonetheless, and I think this is, of course, very important, the ECB has increasingly shown discursive accountability. And it has also increasingly been operating in the shadow of EU politics. It is sought not just to listen, but to hear European parliamentary concerns, in particular from this committee. It's used the European parliamentary hearings as an important tool to bolster its own accountability, not only to the European Parliament, but to the public at large, in, as well as in other, not only in the EP, but in other venues and through speeches, as amplified by the media. You know, we can mention as well that Lagarde has launched the ECB Listens as a more direct public forum I think the key here is that this is not just a publicity tool that the ECB really listens and hears. Note, I note that the ECB's political accountability improved significantly once it moved away from a discursive focus on credibility in the early years of the presidency of um, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, who sought, as well as his predecessor, to avoid even the hint of responsiveness to political influence. Um, we've seen a shift under President Draghi, who increasingly engaged in informal consultation with EU political actors, while maintaining the independence of the ECB, of course. I guess the question for the ECB as an independent actor is how far it should go in terms of informal political engagement, and also how far is too far with regard to independent political action. Certainly, um, President Trichet's secret letters to the prime ministers of Greece, Ireland, Spain, and Italy, threatening to pull the plug on their economies if they did not follow prescribed sets of austerity and structural reform measures, was a political overstretch and outside the bounds of accountability. We can understand the circumstances under which this happened, but certainly in terms of accountability and transparency, this was highly problematic. Now, accountability in, tech, in technical forms is another aspect of, of accountability that is often not thought of, but it serves to a dual purpose. Such accountability in technical forms is really about facilitating central bankers' exchange of information on the latest banking principles, technical innovations, and econometric models. That's one, and two, it enables central bankers to use such information to persuade internal 
stakeholders. Here we're talking governing board members of the necessity and appropriate, appropriateness of shifting bank policies and priorities. We certainly saw this during the 2008 financial crisis. And more recently, we're seeing ongoing dialogue in terms of ideas about macro prudential regulation. We're seeing it in debates about increasing central banking activism everywhere to address climate change, for example, via green bonds or non-neutral um, bond buying. Uh, we see it in terms of debates about how, de how to deal with inequality, including, although this will never happen, deploying helicopter money. Um, well, maybe it will, we'll see. But anyway, there's also about the current pandemic emergency responses. Now, it's important to say that although the ECB is always engaged in su such technical accountability forums, in the Eurozone crisis, it was initially, initially unwilling or unable, legal reasons of course, to listen or act in accordance with emerging, emerging best practices. While the Fed and the Bank of England engaged in quantitative easing, from the onset of the 2008 financial crisis forward, the ECB introduced quantitative easing only in 2015. We can explain e the ECB's slowness, certainly, in terms of legal concerns and internal divisions on what to do. Um, but we could also explain the sort of the slow reinterpretation of its rules and its incremental shift is arguably about its persuasive engagement with these technical accountability forms and their ideas. In short, being part of technical accountability forums um, means that the ECB has been learning and legitimating itself in terms of best practices. Being part of political accountab accountability forums is about the ECB being held to account for its practices in the best interests of the polity. But once we mention the best interests of the policy, what do we mean? And this takes us to questions of to whom the ECB is, not only from to whom the ECB is accountable, to for what purposes. So this is central bank's accountability for what. And part of the problem for the ECB in particular, as we've just been hearing, is its accountability for what, is it's, that its primary objective is price stability and its secondary objective only is to support general economic policies of the EU, employment, growth, the quality of the environment, sustainability and solidarity. Central banks like the US Fed or the Bank of England have both such objectives largely aligned. But here too, we should add that the ECB has changed over time. Um, in, a, in the past, it had a very restrictive reading of its mandate focused on its primary objective. But what we've seen is slowly but surely, the ECB's secondary objective has come close to being on a par. It's not said, but it's certainly done. Certainly looking at the pandemic emergency purchase, purchase program. You know, and this is even if it's not verbalized much in the, pu in the public discourse, it's clearly more and more relevant. And this naturally and importantly matches the best practices of technical accountability forms. The challenge for the ECB is therefore how to define those secondary objectives and legitimate them in a politically accountable manner. Given the more active monetary policy expected today of the ECB than in the past, do we simply leave the ECB to decide yet again about what to do without any political guidance? Is its discursive accountability to the European Parliament sufficient? And what we can say is in its response to the pandemic, the ECB played an important role in saving the Eurozone economy, ensuring this time around that all member states were protected as needed immediately. But what if it had not? What if it had waited longer or remained with the unfortunate initial reaction of President Lagarde, that who had said it was not its job to deal with the spreads between German and Italian bonds? Who or what would hold it to account? Or better, which body now could have pushed it to support the objective, the secondary objective about the general economic policies of the EU effectively? I, you know, this is the question. There really isn't any. So going forward, the question is, how is the ECB to decide what to do and to whom to legitimize it, in particular with these secondary objectives? So what is the future of ECB accountability?
So just to sum up before I go on to where I'm going to recommend, it seems to me that the ECB increased its accountability uh, from an actor focused mainly on credibility to and its independence from politics to one actively seeking to build accountability via forms of political oversight, the European Parliament, and forms of technical expertise, but also through informal consultations with political actors in the Council, plus its communication to the form of public opinion. But is this enough? I think the ECB's narrow primary objective is no longer use of a useful guide, while the secondary objective of supporting the EU's economy is so vast and vague. In short, the final question is, without undermining ECB autonomy, who or what can provide political guidance to ensure ECB accountability? Many difficult, dif different possible answers, um, and many involve pitfalls. Uh, changing the treaties to make the secondary objective co-equal with the primary, a great idea, but perilous given the problems and maybe not necessary since, the second, since everyone recognizes that the secondary objective is key and the primary one moot. Do we create another accountability forum such as the Eurogroup? No. It won't guarantee the EU's best interests and remember their role in the Troika. What about increasing the powers of the European Parliament, uh, going from monetary dialogue to monetary hearings? This is Professor Lastra's idea, very good. The EP still is missing formal sanctions, but those wouldn't actually address our problems in terms of the question of guidance. Um, Although we could, one could argue that the EP could, EP could begin to provide outlines of priorities and secondary objectives, but better yet, it seems to me that we could create a new venue for democratic debate and deliberation on EU macroeconomic governance. Let's call it the Great Macroeconomic Dialogue as a yearly conference to outline grand, you know, grand economic strategies for the current for the coming year. This should be a space for the ECB to engage with other EU-level actors on economic policymaking, not just ministers of finance or relevant commission officials, but also representatives of industry, labor, civil society, and of course, the European Parliament is key and essential in all of this. And my, my sense is it shouldn't be focused on the ECB's monetary policy per se, for jurisdiction, but not all acts that are affected. In particular, now that the stability and growth act is proper, and I've heard the connection. Am I back? He's back. Okay. Can you hear me now? It's okay. Okay, great. Yeah. So I'm just my final words. Now that the stability and growth is no longer operative, with the governing by the ruling members in the Eurozone essentially suspended, not re reformed yet, this is the moment for a new more yearly dialogue to set the direction for economic policy in the Eurozone and the EU more generally. Is the ECB more accountable? EU economic policy making more transparent as well as more democratically legitimate and effective. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, interesting presentations. Now we uh, have um, our Q&A session. I, we have uh, three uh, requests for uh, in, in, uh, questions, so we will take uh, all three of them together and then we will give the floor to the uh, guest speakers for answers. We start uh, with uh, Billy Kelleher from Renew. Mr. Keller, you have the floor. Can you push the speed button? Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, 
Uh, I'd like to thank the two panelists uh, for their views and observations. And again, I think because we live in a democratic process in terms of having uh, national governments, um, uh, national parliaments, the European Council, European elections, that at times people may argue that the European Central Bank is a, an institution that play, plays a profound um, role in people's lives because of the monetary policy they pursue. And at the same time, there's not much known about it unless and until there is an economic crisis or um, a major issue that brings the, you know, the individuals on the governing body or the president of the ECB uh, to national prominence, just like uh, Jean-Claude Trichet would have been very well known in Ireland for a number of years because of the economic crisis in 2008, 9, and 11. But beyond that, on a, you know, uh, an uh, ordinary everyday workings, is there not a a role for the national central banks to explain the decisions of the European Central Bank. Um, you know, to, so that's not just an abstract institution um, in Frankfurt, that is an institution that has not just accountability to the European Parliament, but its decisions uh, can be explained uh, to national parliaments or to national uh, finance committees uh, by the national central banks. And I'm just wondering, is there a role in that? And equally, I asked the, the previous speakers, but I'd like to ask as well, is there any concerns that because of the way that the central bank uh, members are appointed, effectively, governments appoint the central banks uh, at the national level, and then the president of the, or of the central bank then is appointed to the European central bank? And is there not an inherent danger with that system that you could end up with many people because of political changes in member states that could be hostile to the European Union concept around the euro? So in other words, uh, a government campaigns on being anti-euro zone, anti-European, gets elected, nominates uh, a member to the central bank, the national central bank, and subsequently that person then is nominated to the European Central Bank. And is that not an inherent potential systemic risk? Bear in mind, you know, you do have uh, countries that have uh, anti-Europe and anti-euro sentiment. Thank you. Thank you all very much. The next question is uh, from uh, Stasis Yakelunas from the Greens. Yes, uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and uh, dear, dear speakers, dear panelists. Uh, I come from a relatively new uh, member state, and uh, member states uh, have uh, very heterogeneous situations uh, as far as the central banks are concerned. Some of them are monetary policy institutions or whatever is left of the monetary policy at the national uh, level, but some of them, including uh, my own central bank or our own central bank in Lithuania, is responsible for prudential supervision and also business conduct supervision, that means uh, consumer protection. And I, I will uh, call two cases, two examples, which I think uh, is uh, sort of an anomaly, anomaly for my understanding and probably uh, abuse of the, of the independent status of the central bank. One of them was the uh, reaction of the central bank governor when uh, the uh, parliamentary crisis inquiry into the previous crisis uh, was initiated and I was uh, heading that uh, inquiry. Uh, the comments uh, uh, circulated within the central bank uh, departments and the, and the board members was that by the governor and they quote, this is the most senseless work, end of quote. The second case was uh, when the Brexit, uh, you know, uh, started to develop into some sort of a reality. There was starting uh, some sort of supervisory competition, and uh, the same uh, central bank, uh, by by witness of one of the fintech companies, uh, uh, when was asked uh, why uh, it chose uh, the Lithuania for licensing purposes. The answer came that it was invited by the central bank uh, uh, with the, all the mandates. Uh, so. What do you think of these situations and uh, what can be done at the European level to reduce this heterogeneity and also to harmonize the uh, you know, code of uh, ethics uh, at the national central banks? Would you have any, any recommendations? I don't want any other cases, but I was deeply involved in, in, in these two situations and uh, 
it doesn't seem normal to me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I give the floor to the third uh, speaker, Evelyn Regner from SND. Doesn't have a good connection. Fresher connection, one moment, please. We should go to the next speaker. We'll see what we can do for Mrs. Regner. Okay, uh, Mrs. Regner as, uh, um, is trying to uh, reconnect, uh, so in the meantime I would give the floor to the guest speakers to reply to these two questions that we just heard. Uh, we can start uh, from uh, Mrs. Schubert. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. Um, I'll probably start with, with the first question uh, on the role of national central banks in better communicating governing council decisions um, um, uh, to, 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 the, to the audience. I, I commented on this in my introductory uh, statement. And um, I just, I, I think this is, this is of, of eminent importance in particular uh, at the back of the um, distributional consequences of, of monetary policies and the complexity in general of unconventional monetary policies. And I'd just like to mention that uh, the national central banks of the EU, uh, the EU system, national central banks, uh, were engaging in outreach events, uh, outreach events with, with the broader, with, the, with their stakeholders. And uh, I, I think this should be a more, uh, a more, more, more permanent um, uh, permanent process and is this us or Schubert, can you press the speak button, please, again? Thank you. Mr. Schubert, can you please press the speak button? You have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so we can uh, uh, now try to give the floor to uh, Professor Schmidt while we try to reconnect uh, with Mrs. Schubert. Okay, yes. Um, so first, I will answer the first question. Um, uh, question, um, and thank you for that. I think it's tremendously important to have as much communication as possible. Uh, there's no question about that. Um, and I think the, the national central banks can play a major role in explaining the EC, what the ECB does, but it's actually important to recognize that sometimes the central bankers, you know, heads of the central banks, don't necessarily agree entirely with the ECB. It, you know, we can take just one example, which is the Bundesbank, that was a dis dissident voice in at many moments um, in the past decade, and certainly it joined uh, the German constitutional court cases. So, yes, it's important for the national banks to speak, national central bankers to speak, but it's equally and possibly more important that the ECB continues to have a clear voice, not simply at the EU level, but also 
responding to um, issues at the national level so that it should it should be present everywhere. And actually, if you look at ECB um, central bankers, those on the on, on the on the on the um, governing board, they are engaged in speaking all over the place. And often they speak to their national constituencies as well as to other constituencies. So communication is tremendously important, but the ECB continues to need to play a major role in ensuring uh, that the ECB has a voice and that people begin to understand better. I think that Lagarde's um, The ECB Lessons is a very good idea to bring in stakeholders, um, civil society, if you will, and citizens into the process as well. And what would be useful is to ensure that this, that we see this um, everywhere. Uh, the second question about the appointment of the central bank um, and central bankers and the problem, this is definitely a problem. Uh, in particular, what we've seen is the rise of populist anti-system parties gaining power, and there is always a fear that there would be that that um, that would be a problem. This could conceivably um, mean that the central bank itself should be given more powers to um, vet uh, the central banking appointment prior to agreeing to it. I'm not quite sure how you do that. The lawyers uh, here can tell us if you'd need an event, a, a treaty amendment for that or a change in the mandate. But certainly that way would one to do it, would be one way to do it. But another way, and I think this is important to recognize, is the ECB has lots of members and they can outvote dissident members. If you just think that over time, um, in the, at the beginning of the Eurozone crisis, the Bundesbank had a blocking or said a majority coalition. Slowly but surely over time, the Bundesbank found it isolated in terms of its positions. Um, this is also when I was talking about the role of technical accountability forums. It seems to me that really what you saw was, was ECB governors, Draghi in particular, bringing in expertise from outside to say, we need to rethink these rules. Otherwise, how can we explain that the, East, that the Bundesbank was increasingly isolated? This is one example, but what one could argue is similarly for, even if you end up with Eurosceptics sitting on the board, they would conceivably be outvoted or perhaps learn about uh, the discourse of the ECB and how to work it. Um, as for the uh, questions uh, for Lithuania, I'm not an expert on these issues, so I'm not sure that I can um, say much about this um, myself. So I should probably leave it at that. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, unfortunately, I still don't see Mrs. Schubert uh, connected, so uh, she apparently still has problems. But there is uh, Mrs. Regner, and maybe Evelyn wants to uh, ask her question. Sarah, you have the floor. Can you press the speak button, please? Mrs. Regner, can you try to push the speak button again? Thank you. La connexion de Madame Regner n'est pas stable. Okay, I really apologize, but uh, today, unfortunately, we have several uh, connection problems from different parties, so uh, um, Mrs. Schubert couldn't, uh, uh, still is not able to reconnect. 
and also Honorable um, Regner is, uh, is experiencing problems and uh, I see she's trying but in the meantime we are uh, over time and uh, also we have no more translation for available for our, for our event so I think that uh, we will have to close the, the hearing uh, uh, here. I am uh, really sorry but I really thank our uh, guests. This was uh, extremely interesting Thank you for your uh, work, for your ideas and, uh, and uh, proposals. Uh, we will uh, definitely uh, use and take them into account. Uh, these are topics that we uh, address very frequently, as you may imagine, uh, in this uh, committee. So we really value your contribution and actually I think and hope that we will be able to uh, see and hopefully meet each other in person sometime soon. So thank you. Thank you very much to... Uh, uh, all of you uh, have a nice uh, uh, day.